certain path from the, on the part of someone who has trodden that path and knows every corner of it. Basically, he says, if I were first to ask him if it's so simple and if it's every human being's birthright, why don't we do it or how do we do it, he would say there are two ways, and he says this in the sutras. One is detachment, he uses that very term, and the second, constant meditation. Uh, he hasn't defined meditation yet, at least I haven't for you this afternoon. We'll come to that. But if we then say to him, and one is bound to say it, it's very difficult for us to be constantly detached and constantly to meditate. These are very difficult. What now? Guide us. Patanjali would say, all right, that question having been asked, the next thing, the next obvious thing is to realize that to this union, to this self-integration and to this self-discipline, there are obstacles. And it's these obstacles that form a major part, really, of the interest in the sutras. And the obstacles, I've listed them, the five major obstacles, and he lists many others, are first and foremost ignorance, avidya, ignorance about this relative schema of man and the universe, ignorance of misidentifying oneself with matter when in fact one is spirit and therefore using all one's energy eccentrically to coincide with things out there when in fact the yogin attempts to do exactly the opposite to center himself within himself and to learn to experience the reality within so ignorance first of all secondly egoity egoity is synonymous for Patanjali with what he calls the eye maker. He doesn't simply mean egoity in the sense of selfishness, you know, I take the biggest piece of pie and leave you the little one, but he means it in a more fundamental level, in a more fundamental way. The ego is the entity in us, says Patanjali, that blocks this realization of wholeness, of this light, because by definition, it is the eye maker it is the one who falsely makes itself into an entity that is fundamental now Patanjali doesn't deny that in some sense an ego is useful in one's interactions with the daily world if you want to cross the street at the traffic light and so on but he does deny and disputes the fundamental nature of this eye maker and points to the fact that the eye maker really beclouds and constantly interposes himself between the spirit and um, matter. Uh, thirdly and fourthly, there is the obstacles to yoga, uh, Patanjali calls attraction and repulsion or desire and aversion. Today we would in psychology say the whole stimulus response side of man that Skinner and others talk about. Those, because they are powerful and, uh, well, powerful conditioners upon ourselves, again, make this clarity, this detachment, and this perceptivity, discrimination, he calls it, virtually impossible, because one has a vested interest to want more of what's desirable or what is attractive to oneself and to avoid what is not. Therefore, they, again, cloud the mind. They would be rajas or tamas. They would have to do with inertia or with passion, but not with clarity. Um, and lastly, uh, Patanjali calls it clinging to life, but he really means fear, this kind of um, blind, panicky fear, which again robs us of the autonomy to understand, to make decisions, all of which a yogin has to learn to do. Now, what, what if we have noticed these obstacles? What then? Suppose we agree with Patanjali, having walked thus far with him, that these are powerful obstacles and that it's an enormous task in human life to see through them, to even know that they're there, to see through them and perhaps finally to weaken and annul them under the best of circumstances. 
Um, how ought one to do it? And Patanjali says, there are many methods, there are many ways to weaken the pull, the power of these obstacles to reality over oneself, but the, the best known, the, for him, most comprehensive way is what he calls the eight limbs of yoga, and I'll put that on for you. Um, the eight limbs of yoga are a series of steps, if you like, although they all belong together. The one is not less nor more important than the other. It's an organic system. Therefore, one would say it's a whole way of life uh, that uh, is the aim of this union and of this yoking oneself to self-discipline. And five of these he calls the lower limbs and three the higher limbs of yoga. Of the first five, um, the first two we would in the West call ethics. They have to do, and not all of you I know can read this, so I will read them for you. They have the first step, the very first step, is a negative one, if you like. It's self-restraint from, some, from doing something or other. And so what is it that I should restrain myself from doing? What is absolutely the most essential, let's say the most fundamental baby step for someone who wants to uh, do yoga in the fullest sense of the word. And Patanjali says, well, I must abstain from such practices as are simply completely incompatible with the yogic aspiration. And the, among these are, the most fundamental ones are violence. I must abstain from violence. Indeed, obviously, that's fairly easy, but less easy, but also required is to abstain from violence in thought or in feeling that I think Patanjali understood nonetheless reach their objects and hence are harmful to others. They are not just fancies, they are energies that find their object and do harm in the world. So violent, uh, abstinence from violence. Falsehood means not just not lying, but it means it goes into all kinds of nuance, being not exaggerating, etc. All that kind of thing. Accuracy in speech, if you like. Um, abstinence from theft, that would seem so obvious. Um, impurity in one's daily life, when I suppose for, for certainly for Patanjali this would have meant um, abstinence from um, alcohol and, and meat and other things and also it governed sexual rules and laws, especially for the monks uh, who were vowed to brahmacharya, which was really a kind of asceticism. And lastly, greed or acquisitiveness. It would be, just to take that example, it would simply be illogical, it would be incompatible for a monk or for somebody to say, I want to find this total inner stillness over which I will have autonomy and at the same time be wedded to a greedy value in life because, as I'll try to show you in a moment, the two absolutely are going to clash the nature of the mind and the soul being what it is. So the first step then of the eight is uh, self-restraint, yama. The second one is just the mirror image of the first. You abstain from certain things and you try to observe other things. And so these are virtually mirror images, yama and niyama. Observance of purity, contentment, which means a kind of lack of greediness. Contentment with what one needs and not with illimited desires. Contentment with one's lot in life, I suppose, if it can't be altered, that kind of thing. Austerity is the mirror image of not being impure. It's uh, paring down one's needs to the minimum, to simplicity and to order, put it that way. Finally, self-study, which is a kind of self-knowledge. Patanjali says both study of scriptures and um, relating them to my own life is necessary. So self-knowledge, call it that, the old Socratic maxim. <laughs> and finally, self-surrender. Self-surrender is 